Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. What a wonderful text and what a wonderful group of believers we have here at Philippi. They were a very unusual group, and you'll see that as we go through here. My purpose tonight is simply to do this. Confirmation means proof or evidence, to make proof of the truth of something. When God wanted to prove the truth of his promise, he made an oath to confirm the truthfulness of what he said he was going to do. That's what confirmation is. Noun form confirmation. Confirming is part of it, but he says confirmation. It's the proof itself that will be the subject of, of my consideration tonight. And what I want to say is simply this. Wherever the gospel is rightfully proclaimed and received by faith, there will always be proof. That's what I'm going to show you tonight. Now, when I was in Florida, I had some unique experiences. One, a man came to me and said that God sent him to me to teach the congregation that we have there. Uh, he believed the tribulation was going to be coming soon, and so he wanted to prepare the people for that time. In the midst of our conversation, the gospel came up, and he said, what is the gospel? That's the problem today. There are a lot of people, men that say they are called, they don't know what the gospel is, and so there is an unclear sound that is going out on our day. It's no reason that we should believe that the soldiers aren't rallying together and fighting the good fight of faith. What we need is a very clear word on the gospel of Christ Jesus. That's what we need, and that's, that's what I hope to supply tonight. Pressure's on, right? Now, Every year we come together for this purpose, to clarify the nature and content of the gospel. Every single year we do that. We will not forsake that. That is our objective, to clarify the gospel. There are a number of reasons why we do that. One is this, because we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. The human race fell through the alteration of what God said by the influence of the enemy. And he is still in the business of altering. And so there is a need to continue to clarify what we've already talked about and what we already know to remind you of these things again, because that is safe. But there's another reason which has more to do with my text, and it is this, because salvation is a great work. The gospel is not merely a basic message and tool whereby we evangelize the lost. It's more than that. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, this question is given, how shall we escape if we neglect so great, so great salvation? See, we should expect that of God to do something great, right? The work of salvation is a great work. In fact, you will spend your life enlarging the borders of your understanding of what the gospel is. Which is why we don't forsake it. Which is why we come back to it. And have you noticed that every time we come back to it each year that the borders seem to be going out a little further? Have you noticed that? That's because salvation is a great salvation. God's done a great work, and we're going to spend our lives going back over this gospel because there is so much to be seen and so much to be apprehended, okay? Now, the fact that we can have proof, the confirmation of the gospel. You are partakers with me in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. The fact that there is a confirmation tells me that the work of God's effective. God's the one supplying the proof. You have to ask yourself, can God endeavor to do something and then not bring it to pass? Can God do something that is ineffectual and impotent? Do you know of anything that God has done like that? Well, I couldn't get that one done. Whenever God wanted to made the, make the world, he made it in six days. Of course, he rested on the seventh day because he was so tired, you know. This vast creation we have, this was no trouble for God. 
when humanity mounted up a resistance there in the plains of Shinar, did God have any trouble just kind of spreading the people out? What are we going to do? Whenever Satan rebelled in heaven and sin was found in him, Jesus said he saw him fall from heaven like lightning. Of course, you know like I do, God doesn't have any opponents. No worthy opponents. Let me say it that way. When God wanted to make an entire nation out of nothing, was it hard for him to do? He said, live, and it came forth. See? When God wanted to deliver that nation from captivity in Egypt, did he get it done? Tell me of a work that God has done that he has not done. You know what I'm saying? Salvation is that kind of work. Salvation is not a work of man. It's a work of God. If you're made effective, you're made effective by the God that's working in you, both the will and do of his own good pleasure. He's the primary worker. The government is on Jesus' shoulders. So we should expect an effective work. He's the reason why we have confirmation. The work of salvation always yields results that are observable. Whenever the persecution of Stephen took place and the brethren were spread out, some of them went as far as Antioch preaching the gospel. And the scripture says the hand of the Lord was with them. So the brethren went down there to see that, that this was actually a work of the Lord. And the scripture says that when Barnabas saw the grace of God, he was glad. Can you tell me a place where grace has worked and can't be seen? Here's something that was said about the Colossians, and it's true of all of us. Colossians 1, 6, the apostle Paul affirmed to them, the gospel which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit. The gospel doesn't do anything but that. It brings forth fruit. You know, there are a lot of misconceptions today about what, what's fruitful. You notice that? See, how do we know that God's really in the place, as they say? How do we know that God is really, really working here? There's a lot of misconceptions about that today. Some people think irrational behavior in the assembly and rambling and foaming at the mouth and falling on the ground. And Sorry, I don't mean to despise any, anybody, but that's stupidity. That's not a confirmation of divine working. That's more of a confirmation of demonic working. How about the increase of a budget in a campus? Boy, God's really working here. God's working here. We got a bigger campus than we've ever had. Well, maybe God is there, but that's not what grace does. Or how about the, we say this a lot, the accruing of earthly possessions and the fact that we're not sick can be a blessing, but is that what grace does? Not really. You can be Epaphras in prison, sick, and the grace of God on you. Amen. We need to have an understanding of what fruitful is and what effective is. Because without a clarification of this proof, confirmation, God's people are going to have a very difficult time knowing that they have eternal life. You see, that's kind of where I'm going with this. How about the influx of unbelievers into the church? I want to see the lost saved, but that's not necessarily a sign that God's working. Not necessarily. You know, God has really not left this up to speculation. God has told us. God has told us exactly when he worked, what would be the result of it. The confirmation, the proof of it. For example... In the prophets, Psalm 85, 10. Now this will be familiar too. I've chosen all these texts. I know that all these are very familiar to us and we handle them quite a bit. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So what would be the result of that happening? This marvelous poetic way of talking about the justice that took place in the cross of Christ. What would be the result of that? 
Verse 12 and 13, yea, the Lord shall give that which is good and our land shall yield her increase. Fruitful. What kind of fruitfulness? Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. So if, if our ways really aren't like his ways, then you need to be saved. I saw a sign one time, it was coming down a street here in Joplin, I saw a sign. It's one of those rare times where I saw a church sign that was actually pretty good. And it said this, if grace has not changed you, then grace has not saved you. That's true. You see, there's always fruit, always fruit where God's working. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. See, we'll be walking in his steps. We're doing that now, aren't we? We're walking like Jesus. We love what Jesus loves. We don't want to go where Jesus yeah. doesn't want to go. Huh? You see defilement in a temple, doesn't it get you upset? Let's get you upset. Something in there is taking glory away from God, get you upset. Huh? You see a man of faith, don't you rejoice in that? You see a man of faith, you rejoice like Jesus does. See, set us in the way of his steps. That's the confirmation. God's given us the confirmation. Isaiah 32, 1. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. We know who that is. And princes shall rule in judgment. How about that? That is to say, Jesus is gonna have a following of people that know how to make proper assessments of things. Down in verse three and four, the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. The heart also of the wrath shall understand knowledge. How about that? And the tongue of the stammerer shall be ready to speak plainly. We need that. Is that what's happening right now? Wherever that's happening, God is working in that place of a truth. Amen. See, God's work is marked by that, by understanding, by perception, the ability to hear, the desire to hearken, all of that is the evidence of God's working. Wherever that's not happening, God's not working there, at least not at that time. That's the truth. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19 and 20. I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh that, here's the results. You know, when Peter when Peter spoke about the sufferings of Christ, he said something really important. He talked about the sufferings of Christ and he said the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. That's the confirmation. It's the effect. What has resulted from what God has done? Huh? That they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them. Love them, do them. People don't like to talk, a lot, talk about works, do they? Don't like to talk about works, don't like to talk about works. Well, I understand if you're talking about on the foundational level, that's not where your works go. But when we're talking about confirmation, listen, brothers and sisters, you are saved by grace, you are confirmed by works. What are you doing? Because a profession without possession is pointless. Amen. It just means you don't have what you say you got. We expect a proof. Because wherever God works, there's proof. God's not austere. In fact, right there, he's not saying, now this is what you better do, is it? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, this is what I'm going to do. Amen. And this is what's going to result. They're going to have one heart, one way. That's how, that's how they're going to be. So if there's a lot of divisions taking place, it may not be God. I know there may be a sword, you know, put a sword between the family, but I'm talking about in the faith. That's not God working. That's not him. Now, the grace of the Apostle Paul is this kind of grace. It's effective. In the seventh verse, Paul says this, ye are partakers of my grace. 
So what kind of grace are we talking about? What kind of grace did Paul have? It's this. It's the grace to get done what the prophet said would happen. It's the grace that makes Paul an effective minister. Paul was not trying to minister. Well, I hope this works. I'm doing my best. I'm guessing. I hope this works. I'll try this over here. I hope that works. Things aren't working out of Galatia. I must be doing something wrong. Paul knew he was a master builder. Paul didn't have doubts about his work. When you read about Paul's work, you don't get the idea he had doubts about his work. Not because he was a prideful man, but because he was what he was by the grace of God. Paul was an effectual minister. Consider his commission. When Jesus commissioned him in Acts 26, 16, he said, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. Jesus can make you an effective minister. I think we've seen a number of those here, haven't we? We've seen a number of effective ministers. If they're effective, then Jesus made them. That's Jesus. Whatever Jesus intends to do, Jesus is able to do. You know that. Just look at his miracles. Huh? Never had a misstep. Never had a misstep. See, when Jesus wanted to pay his taxes, just the first fish, pull that up. Pay yours and my taxes. Huh? When Jesus wanted to raise a man, he just called out Lazarus, came forth, came forth. See? When Je These miracles are absolutely wonderful. I love to, I love to rehearse the miracles because it's a picture of a king reigning in righteousness. He just, everywhere Jesus was, he just kind of had control over things, see? Paul was given this kind of grace to be a witness both of the things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, verse 18, for this purpose, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Not to try to do this. You are going to do this, Paul. You're going to do this. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's the grace that he was given. Amen. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 1, verse 5, the apostle made this testimony. We have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. That does not mean everybody received Paul's message. But everybody that received grace from Paul's message, this was the result. See? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, we have this word, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. That's Paul. Now, brethren, grace is an effectual working resource. He says, you are partakers of my grace. This is a critical part of the confirmation because it's the grace that's producing the evidence whereby confirmation can take place. Grace is an effective working resource. Well, the devil did a number when he confused grace and mercy. When people have in their heads, when they think about grace, they more think about failure than they do think about ability. That is not the picture we get of grace when we look in the scriptures. For example, the grace of God brings salvation. If salvation didn't come, it's because they didn't receive grace. That's the truth. You can reign in life through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Romans 6, 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. You know why? Because you're not under law, but under grace. It's not gonna have dominion. If it has dominion, somehow you're not getting grace. Something's not right. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, the grace of Christ, that grace whereby he was made poor so that what? You might be made rich, right? Grace comes with a lot of resources. It does. Every spiritual blessing. Colossians 4, 6. Your speech is to be always with grace. You remember why? So that you may know how to answer every man. You can't give a patent answer to everybody. Put away your evangelistic card. Doesn't work that way. You got to know how to answer every man. Grace will make you effective. That's grace. 
2 Thessalonians 2.16 says that we are given everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. It's through grace that we look into that time when there shall be no time and we're happy about it. Right? Everlasting consolation. Good hope through grace. 2 Timothy 2.1, we need this admonition today. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You don't have to stay weak. You can be strong if you're in grace. Grace will make you strong so that you could stand, so that you could be immovable, so that you're not moved by trouble and tribulation when it comes. You don't have to be in panic mode all the time when tribulation comes. You can stand in the grace of God. See, that's grace. That's the kind of grace Paul was given to minister. That's the kind of grace that the Philippians had received. I'll get to them in just a second. How about this, in Hebrews 2, 9, do you know Jesus is one of the exemplary examples of the grace? For by the grace of God, he tasted death for every man. Think of all the marvelous things that have come to us as a result of Jesus' death. It is an ex exhibition of grace. It's what it is, the manifold grace of God. See how effective it's been? Do you know that your sins are forgiven tonight? You can respond if you want. That's, that means grace is effective. Do you see? Some little, little confirmation there, okay? And on and on we could go, but this one word, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you always having all sufficiency. Sorry. I need some grace here. In all things may abound to every good work. Did you notice all those marvelous words like all, every? Yeah, that's grace. It's a matter of are we, are we receiving that grace or not? You know, the Apostle Paul was himself a marvelous example of the grace of God changing a man. Paul's testimony about his conversion is found in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 through 16. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but here's what he said about himself before. Who before was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. That was very prudently said. Paul was wreaking havoc on the church, hailing men off into prison. See? But when Jesus met him and intercepted him on the road to Damascus, things changed. And here's what Paul said about the, that occasion. The grace of God was exceeding abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Paul made a 180 turn. This man who was wreaking havoc on the church became one of the greatest assets the church has ever had. And he did it immediately, starting in Damascus and reaching out after Barnabas found him. He is an example, he said in that text, of what grace would do in everybody that would receive that grace from him. As in, I'll tell you, I, I love the Apostle Paul. I love the Apostle Paul. You realize how much you have received as a result of the grace that was given to Paul. I would never, obviously, I would never put him in a pedestal over Jesus. But this is a key kingdom worker. And it's through his marvelous work that we have this confirmation. That's wonderful. Now, he says here that the Philippians partook of that grace. It is meet for me to think this of you all. It is meet, is appropriate, it's proper for me to think, it's proper for me to have confidence towards you Philippians. It's right. What kind of confidence? Well, verse six, he tells you what the confidence is. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Christ. I'm confident that that will happen at Philippi. Now, I'll tell you this, Paul was not confident that that was going to happen in other places. Just in case you didn't know. And I'm sure you did. I'm not insulting your intelligence. Paul did not think that way about every church, and he didn't say that to every church, did he? To the Galatians, he said this, I'm afraid of you. 
To the Philippians, I'm confident of you. But to the Galatians, he said, I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of you. It wasn't because he doubted God's work. It's because he could see there was something coming between them and grace. He said, you are fallen from grace. To the Corinthians, he said this, I fear I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would. I'm going to be disappointed. I'm afraid. I'm afraid when I get there, I'm going to be disappointed in what I see. See, he didn't have this confidence with everybody. I don't have this confidence about everybody. And if you're honest, you don't either. Hmm? As much as we want to be optimistic, and I understand that, it's good to be optimistic, but it's also good to speak the truth. And if you're not confident about an assembly, don't tell them you are. We do not need pretension. It doesn't help. It doesn't help. And Paul wasn't pretending. He went around to certain places. He had to say some things, no doubt, that were hard to say. It's not like he said these with a light heart. Not at all. With a heavy heart, he'd say these things, but he did have to say some difficult things, but not to the Philippians. It's me for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart. Think of some of the things that he said about the Philippians. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, every time. Do you have brethren like that? Every time you think about them, every single memory you've made with them is a good one. It's a good one. There's no bad ones. It's a good one. Well, see, there, I, I've had some bad ones. I must have blown it. Well, no, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to hurt somebody who's maybe slipped out of the way, you know. But there are certain brethren that you know that every time you think about them, it's always good. It's always good. That is, in his prayers, he was thinking this. Always and ever prayer of mine for you all. Don't miss those kind of words for you all. Every one of them, faithful. Make and request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul didn't have to deal with any problems in Philippi. No doctrinal errors that he had to deal with. Do you realize the Philippians are not a super church? They're a normal church. They are an example of what the grace of God does when it is not disrupted by false teaching, some kind of error, some kind of division. They're an example of what grace does. I thank God for the Philippians and I thank God for the brethren I know that are like this. Brethren, we're talking about an effective salvation. That's what we're talking about. A salvation that declares evidence that can be evidently seen not just for you. I want to give you this one last thing. I've already gotten the wave. I got five minutes. Okay, so <laughs> let me wrap this up in five minutes. You know, not everybody knows they have eternal life that is saved. And so the evidence of the gospel helps them put a handle on something that can't be seen. You can't see eternal life. But eternal life, like the wind, leaves evidence, right? Just like the children of God, John chapter 3. And so that the gospel that brought them eternal life in the first place will provide the evidence so that they can see. But now let me give you, let me give you some, a little bit different that I've seen in this that I think is very important to see. People are not the only one watching salvation. Do you remember the mercy seat? And the angels pointed towards one another, looking down. Remember what Peter said about the angels? They anxiously desire to look into these things. You know what God's doing in this confirmation work? He's showing to heavenly principalities what he's doing. Your conversation provides the proof. When you keep the faith, it's angels that are beholding things about God in that. That's the highest form of confirmation. One example, and I'll done after this example. The Lord came to Abraham and said, Take now thine son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, 
and take him to a mountain and offer him as a burnt offering. I don't think he even told him at that point where he was supposed to go. But remember, he rose up early in the morning and he did that. And as he raised up the knife, you remember what the scripture says? The angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is the one that halted the process. You remember what the angel said? Now I know. You see, when you keep the faith, you're not the only ones that get, a, get in on the knowing business. The angels that are beholding the marvelous work of salvation, and I think they're probably the greater audience, but nonetheless, that's just an opinion. But they're seeing God work. And God is being glorified by that. You realize how many communion meditations have probably been written and spoken about that text of Scripture? Because Abraham, unknowing to himself, was showing forth how the father was going to take the son whom he loves and get up on a mountain, and the two alone would provide an offering that would save the world. Now listen, brethren, when we believe the gospel and receive it, God will produce that kind of evidence. I don't know exactly how it will portray itself in your life, but somehow the life of Christ will be manifested in your mortal body. That will bring glory to God, will cause for angels to rejoice. And if it causes them to rejoice, you know what it does for us? Rejoicing too. And so, as an exhortation, this is my encouragement to us. We want to always strive, strive, strive to clarify the truth of the gospel. That isn't just oratory. It involves understanding and perception. doesn't mean you have to use big words. It's best if we just speak plainly huh? so that those that read can run. But this is our business today. There's a lot of garbage out there being called the gospel. This is part of the work we've been given is to clarify, 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 rehearse the gospel again and again because it is the power of God unto salvation. It's the reason why Paul wasn't ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of it. I know you're not ashamed of it. So that's what we want to be doing. Thank you for your time, brother. Amen.